Hello, and welcome to Making Sense of It. I am Mona Duncan, your moderator. Uh, do you ever wonder why you do the things you do? Well, thanks for turning in because this is our gift to you from the Glasser Institute for Choice Theory. Each week we have someone that is certified tell us about a concept that they use as is familiar with Dr. Glasser's uh, Choice Theory and Reality Therapy. And today is one of our favorite speakers is back with us, and it is Jeff Steedman, and he's all the way from Australia. So welcome, Jeff. And uh, I'm going to say good morning, but it's good afternoon to you. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. And welcome to those that are watching uh, live as well as that will be watching this later. So uh, thanks for being here, and I'll turn it over to you and just let you go. He's going to be talking to us today about fight, flight. So sounds very interesting. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Mona. And uh, hello, Alice. Good to yeah, see you, John. Um, Hi. Yeah, so fight, fight, flight. It's an interesting um, concept. And for a long time, um, I had people coming in and I, I thought, how do I mesh um, our understanding of fight, flight with choice theory? So I'll come up with a, a process, which I'm going to outline for you to, to, uh, today. Um, I'm just going to click share screen. And there will be an opportunity to uh, for people to uh, comment as we're going through. So no problems there if you would like to chat. So can you just indicate to me, can you see uh, a blue head? Yes. It's oh, yeah. That's the, we're going well. <laughs> the first part has worked well. I'm, I'm wrapped. I'm trying a, a new uh, process for me. Um, in that I'm going to whiteboard and uh, scribble and so on um, as as I go through. So let's see how all of that works. So I'm going to go through two things. I'm just going to explain the fight flight process to begin with, and then I'm going to link it at the end with Glass's needs. But you'll actually, I think you'll get an inkling as we're going through how it actually fits in. Um, I use this in a practical sense. In fact, I just had a client prior to this and went through this whole process with them. It's someone who's been uh, bipolaring for a very long time, um, experiencing the highs and lows that go with that. And uh, it was very exciting for them to learn this. And they've gone away with a big smile on their face. So hopefully uh, the audience today will as well. So fight, flight. Let's look at um, let, let's look at the process, and this is me. Bear with me if I'm not as super fast as I could be here, but um, I will I will get there. Okay, so the first thing is that uh, when we're presented with a a threat, and we'll call that uh, a physical threat. So something that's outside of us, that's uh, likely to um, in some way uh, threaten us, hurt us, damage us. When we're presented with that threat, the message um, goes directly to our brain. So I'm going to just draw that on. I can get rid of that. There we go. So the message goes directly to the brain. And we try to make some sort of sense out of that. Now, the brain is responsible for a number of different things. It's responsible for um, creativity and imagination and memory and a whole lot of other things but I'm not so much interested in those things. I'm interested in these particular ones, logic, reasoning, and problem solving. So logic, reasoning, and problem solving um, are what the tasks that the um, modern brain carries out. The part of the brain that we're talking about at the moment is one that we call um, or can call the, the modern brain. It's, it's the part of the brain 
where you are very conscious of, and when you're thinking of yourself, it's your modern brain that you're aware of. But we have another part of the brain um, which, which also uh, exists, and I'm going to talk to you about what that is in a minute. Um, in fact, I might do that. I might do that now. But logic and reasoning and problem solving, all of that is carried out by the modern brain. So it's busy doing those things. So when the threat comes in, we are trying to process exactly what to do using those mechanisms of logic, reasoning, and problem solving. The problem is that they're too slow. It's a very slow process to be able to work things out. And we are all descended from ancestors that didn't use a lot of logic, reasoning, or problem solving when they were presented with a threat. When we were sitting perhaps in jungles with just a stick or a rock or whatever it might be to defend ourselves and something came crashing through the bushes towards us, if we were sitting there thinking, oh, I wonder what that might be. Sounds like it's something big. I wonder if it could be something that could hurt me. I wonder if it could be something that I, I should maybe escape from or do something about. The, our ancestors that did that were probably the ones that were eaten. The ancestors that didn't do that, the ones that shot up the tree at the first sign of that, were the ones that survived. So gradually over a period of time, we developed um, a process where if we were presented with a threat, we would take off up the tree. Because logic, reasoning and problem solving is too slow. Often we'll do that later on, but we won't do that when we're immediately pre presented with the threat. So what are we, what are we uh, drawing on? We're actually drawing on our other part of the brain that resides down here. And we can call that the primitive brain. Now, the, peri the part we're interested in is the amygdala, but we don't need to remember that. It's enough to just think of it as the primitive brain. And the nice thing about, about this is that when we get that message of threat, we will immediately go to the primitive brain with that message as well. So as you can see, it goes to it goes to both places. It goes to the primitive brain and it also goes to the modern brain. <clears throat> and the primitive brain, it really only has a couple of tasks to do. But its main purpose, it's very, um, I guess, basic pur purpose of the, of the primitive brain is in fact survival. And it just ticks along underneath, basically without us being aware of it most of the time, just looking after our survival needs. So it's important to understand that about the, the uh, primitive brain because human beings have a bit of an arrogance uh, in that we often think that our modern brain is what's in charge all of the time, but it's not. When we're presented with a threat, because the modern brain um, operates so slowly, the primitive brain will always take over, always. If, if the threat is big enough, it will take over. And it operates without us being aware that it's doing that. And most of us, when it does that, actually don't, don't like it, don't understand it, might even fear the results of that. So we're gonna go through that a little bit um, today, exactly what happens. If I can give you an example of how some of the things that the primitive brain does, for example, today, 
hopefully in the period of time that you've been watching uh, this particular uh, explanation, hopefully you've been breathing. Hands up if you've been breathing. Yes, good, <laughs> everyone's been breathing. I'm really delighted to hear that. So <clears throat> you haven't been thinking about that breathing. Your modern brain hasn't really been involved. You've just done it. Your modern brain has been not been calculating oxygen levels, CO2 levels, how amount of en energy in, energy out, and calculating just how rapidly you need to breathe. All of that has been done by your primitive brain. And it just does it ticking along underneath without us consciously being aware of it. And that's what it's supposed to do. It's responsible for all of those survival things. And of course, sometimes we can overrule the primitive brain for a little while. For example, can we hold our breath? With the modern brain, we can stop breathing. But we can't keep stop breathing. We can't continue to stop breathing. What will happen is that the primitive brain is still making those calculations. And at some point, no matter how much with your modern brain you try to hold your breath and not breathe, you will breathe. It will happen because the primitive brain will step in and say, sorry, modern brain, I'm taking over now. And it's a case of Elvis has left the building. Your modern brain is no longer in charge. Your primitive brain has taken over. So that's just one of those survival things. Um, but it's important to um, really highlight that for us, even though we think that our modern brain is always in charge, it's not always. The primitive brain, when it needs to, will take over. So when we're presented with a threat, that message does go to the primitive brain. And most of us are aware of what actually happens when we're presented with that threat. We'll do one of two things. We will either fight or we will flight. I'll just pop that in as well. So there's our fight and flight. And most people have heard of those two, um, those two uh, processes. But the thing I want you to know about them is that they are really the same thing. Now, we can say that they're the obverse side of the same coin. If I toss a 20 cent coin up in the air and it lands heads, it's still a 20 cent coin. If I toss it up in the air and it lands tails, it's still a 20 cent coin. Fight and flight are like that. It's a, a very, a very um, similar process. The physiology that takes place when we're presented with threat in fight flight is exactly the same. And I'll, I'm going to go that, through that with you in just a moment. So if we look at the physiology or, or the fight flight, we will fight when we, on, on two occasions, one, we will fight when we're presented with a threat that we believe we can beat. So the primitive brain has some ability to do an evaluation. It can learn. And if it learns that something is threatening, but you know what, that's not much of a threat, we may choose to fight. The other time we'll choose to fight is when we have no opportunity, when we're cornered, and we, we have absolutely no option other than to protect ourselves. Those are the two times we'll fight. Conversely, we will flee, flight, when the threat in our evaluation of our primitive brain is either too great and also when we have an opportunity. But in reality, we don't often just do one or the other. We mainly will either... Um, fight for a while, then flee if there's an opportunity, or flee until we're caught and then fight. Um, we're going to do pretty much the same. And that's why the physiology for both of them are the same. Most people don't know that. They think of fight and flight as two different things. So really the only difference between the two 
is the action that you take when you have evaluated through your primitive brain the level of threat. Other than that, they're the same thing. So let's have a bit of a look at that physiology. But so far, we haven't talked too much about glasses um, knees, but you might be starting to see how it might fit in. Whoops, that was a dr uh, wrong uh, wrong button. Uh, I'm still still got my um, learner's license with this, but <laughs> I'm there. We go. Okay, so here's the the physiology. Some of it. I'm not going to do all of it, but do the interesting ones. So we might increase our breathing. Why do we do that? Very simply, we need to get more oxygen and rich blood uh, into our system. That's why we increase our breathing. We might increase our heart rate. Why do we do that? So that we can pump the oxygen and enrich blood around our bodies. Let's put that down there. Okay, what else might we do? We could sweat. Why do we do that? If we're going to be fighting or flighting, we're going to be burning a whole lot of energy. And so we turn on our air conditioning unit in preparation for that. That's what's called a cold sweat. Once we're um, fighting and fighting and burning a lot of energy, it's a warm sweat then, of course. But a cold sweat, it's, it's quite clever. It will turn it on immediately. And just to check, if you think about it, no matter how hard I try right now to sweat, no, it's not happening. I'm not squeezing anything out at all. So I can't, with my modern brain, sweat, but if somebody came through that door over there right now with a machete, I would break out in a sweat because my primitive brain will have issued that instruction. That's very important to understand how it just ticks along until it's required. Our muscles can tense up. Why do they do that? They do that in preparation for fighting or fleeing. So we tense up like at the start of a race, ready to fight or flee. Primitive brain will just tell them. I don't have to think, oh, I better get ready to fight or flee. It will happen instantaneously. We will shake. That doesn't seem to have any useful purpose, but it does. When we get the message from the prim primitive brain that we're under threat, when it gets a message from outside, we've seen it or heard it, um, it will take, take make the decision to get that message out to every single cell in our body. Now, it does that through the nervous system, but that doesn't get everywhere. It also does it through our hormonal system, through adrenalines, noradrenalines, and catecholamines. Just floods our body with those hormones. And that's the shakiness that we feel. And it's interesting because... We don't know what that is. We often think there's something wrong with us. A lot of this normal physiology, normal physical functioning, we think is wrong and shouldn't be happening. We should be sweating. A cold sweat is normal. It's healthy. It's your body doing what it should do. We should shake. That's the result of our body doing what it should do. Most people think when they're shaky like that, oh, I don't know what's wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. No, there's nothing wrong with you. Your body is doing exactly what it should do. What else might happen? Confu confused thought can occur. And the reason for confused thought is that our modern brain is not in action. Elvis has left the building. The primitive brain is in charge. So we don't make good decisions when we're under threat and in fight flight, because the modern brain isn't really involved in that. And that's why when you're in that situation, often afterwards you think, oh, I should have said this and I should have said that and I should have done this and why did I do that? And 
The reason is because your modern brain wasn't engaged. Nothing wrong with you. That's the way it's supposed to be. Some more physi physiology. Our pupils dilate. And they do that so we can see more, so we can see more effectively. Um, we can get butterflies or nausea. And, you know, that will be familiar to you. We get the butterflies and nausea. So down in our, our intestines, we have this horrible creeping feeling. And it's really interesting because people, again, think when they feel that, that there's something wrong with them. But that's actually your system, your physiology, doing something quite amazing. What it's doing is literally removing, first of all, stopping the digestive system, shutting it down, because digesting food takes a great amount of energy. And we want to put all of our energy into fighting or fleeing, into the physicality of that. The interesting part of that is that, again, my modern brain, I can't just say, well, I can say it, but it won't make any difference. I'm going to stop digesting my food now. No, nothing's happened. But if I was under threat, it would happen instantaneously. I don't think about it. The modern brain is not involved. Primitive brain will just do it. But it's even more clever than that. Now, we have a blood supply, a rich blood supply around the stomach and intestines, and we can remove some of that and redirect it to the major muscle groups to fight and flee. And that's that creeping, crawling, squirming sort of feeling and that empty feeling that you can get in your stomach, in, your, in, in the stomach and intestines area. As I said to you, it's a pretty amazing system. Okay. Um, our, did I better just make sure I'm clicked on it. There we go. Our bladder and bowel can get involved. And people mm -hmm. often say when I'm talking to people about this, they'll say, and, and I, when, if I'm doing a, a session with a, a client, I'll say, why do you think it does that? And they usually say, oh, to make you lighter. <laughs> so you can run away more effectively. No, it's not that. We don't eliminate enough to become that much lighter that we become super fast. Our bladder and bowel will um, empty because it's a primitive response to threat. Um, I remember when I first moved to East Gippsland, which is part of Victoria, Australia, uh, part of the Gippsland Lakes, wonderful area. And close to us is a place called the morass. And in the morass, we have turtles. They're uh, native to the area. And quite often there's a road that runs through the morass. They walk up onto the road and walk across the road <clears throat> and into the swamp on the other side. When I first moved up here nearly 40 years ago, <clears throat> I was driving along, passing through the morass, thinking, oh, this is a wonderful area, all the wild birds and um, just wonderful thing to have. It's, it's on the uh, Ramsar um, pr protection area, one of the Ramsar wetlands. Um, but there was a turtle crossing the road. Now, they don't cross the road very quickly. So I thought, being a newbie from the city, I thought, I'll rescue this turtle. So, I, sorry, tortoise, tortoise, not turtle. So I pulled over in front of him, got out the car, walked over, picked the tortoise up, and he very kindly piddled all down the front of me. And it was the foulest, most horrible smelling concoction that you could possibly imagine <laughs> so why did he do that so that i'd go oh yuck and let him be not want to eat him not want to do anything with him and that's why we empty our bowel and bladder uh, by the way i still rescue tortoises but i'm very careful to figure out which end is pointing towards me now <laughs> always the head always all right so what else we also can get right down to the micro level. So our white blood cells get involved. Now they're responsible for a whole range of things, but one of the tasks of the white blood cells is to attack infection. 
So when we're presented with a threat, our white blood cells are activated. Think of a the white knight on its white charger charging around our body looking for infection to fight. Now, I can't trigger that with my modern brain. I can't say, right, white blood cells, not directly anyway, go and attack that infection. Well, I can say it, but probably nothing much is going to happen. But my primitive brain can trigger that immediately. And again, instantaneously, they will do that. And that's where the hormonal system comes in, where those chemicals that are released into the body will activate them. Also, my platelets will get involved. And again, the part that I'm interested in, what the platelets do, is blood clotting. So when we're presented with a threat, the primitive brain will activate the platelets to go around and look for holes in our body to plug up. It's a pretty wonderful system when you think about it. So it's doing all of these things immediately, instantaneously. And most of it we're not even aware of. And because when I have clients come in, they don't know this. They think when they have a lot of these things happening to them, that there's something wrong with them. And they get an immense sense of relief when they realize it's normal, healthy physiology, that it's your body doing what it should do. Talking of physiology, I think I missed the why there. There we go. So normal, healthy physiology. Now that happens when we're presented with a physical threat and it happens automatically. We still haven't made the, any link to glassa. I'm coming, I'm coming to that. It's like that offer, but there's more. It's coming. If we kept doing this long-term, the first thing that would happen is we would die. If with that physiology turned on and it just kept going, we would die because it takes an immense amount of energy to do that. So we need a mechanism to turn it off. Also, long-term, it has deleterious effects. If we are constantly um, triggering our, this response through our primitive brain and it's constantly responding to threat in this way, we can lead to all sorts of problems like an enlarged heart, um, heart valve problems, coronary artery disease, muscle strains and tears, headaches, migraines, uh, gastrointestinal problems, uh, even obesity and or eating problems. Uh, immune system can break down because the white blood cells are being um, fired up so often. We can get autoimmune diseases where the body starts to attack itself. Um, we get poor decision-making and poor memory. And in the end, it can lead to accelerated aging and even premature death. So whilst this is a wonderful system, it's not one we want turned on on a regular basis. Now, all of you have felt that physiology, but there wasn't a physical threat. I'll come back to that in just a moment. So what is our mechanism for turning it off? How can we, how can we do that? Well, the way that we do that is through physical activity or exercise. So the physical activity, uh, whoops. Exit, there we go. Small writing, it's hard to see. Exercise, so the, the physical activity of fighting and flighting is the exercise. That's, that's what um, turns off our fight-flight um, process. So if we look at it, I'm not sure how to get rid of that. I'll try and drag it down. There we go. Um, so if we look at it, fight-flight, when we fight and flee, in terms of primitive brain and olden times, um, we would either basically win or lose. A win is either we'd got to the top of the tree and we were safe, in which case I was sticking my tongue out and going, 
like this to the whatever was threatening me, but I'm feeling pretty darn good. Or I've actually fought it and I've defeated it and I'm standing there with my foot on whatever it was and I'm waving my fist in the air and I'm feeling fantastic. Two sets of hormones are produced through that. And those hormones are endorphins and the endorphins are produced by the physical activity but also oxytocins and they're our feel-good hormones the oxytocins are because we're feeling so good having um, been successful so we're flooded with endorphins and oxytocins and we're feeling pretty darn good but it has another task over here in our physiology, it turns all that off. If we don't fight and flee, this wouldn't be turned off. It would just continue. We need those endorphins and oxytocins to actually switch it off. Now, that's our natural system. And we've experienced all of that. But the interesting thing is, how does that fit with, with what Glasser had to say? Let's have a look. So we have the threat. If we can call these threats threat number one, there's a second set of threats that arise up here in our modern brain. And those threats are the ones that we, ex we are very aware of and experience, but don't truly understand what they are in the main. People who know Glass's stuff pretty well will know that. They are threats to our self or to our who we are as a person, whereas these threats, physical threats, are threats to our body. And in Glass's terms, threats to ourselves are, in fact, threats to our needs. And those needs, of course, are survival, love and belonging, freedom, fun, and power. So we experience threats to all of them. Now, the outside threats that I talked about before is in fact really just to our survival needs. These ones are just to our survival. But we can also experience in our modern brain a threat to our survival or our love and belonging, freedom, fun and power. So it can either be um, from outside for survival, primarily that's from outside, but all the others sit inside our modern brain. And here's the problem. And this is where knowing Glass's um, understanding of how we work is so important and knowing the needs. When we are presented with a threat in our modern brain, the message also goes from our modern brain Oops, try to draw again. To our primitive brain. And the primitive brain is just that. It doesn't know the difference between these threats outside and these threats from inside. And being a primitive brain, it kicks into fight flight, which works really well for physical threats and really poorly for threats to our needs that arise in the modern brain. Because when I flee and run across the room or from Victoria to Queensland or off to uh, Texas where Mona is, unfortunately, guess what? I take that threat with me. It's still there. I can't fight it directly because it's in my head. It's a threat to my needs. I can't fly, flee from it because I take it with me. So fight flight works wonderfully for a 
an actual physical threat and causes us real problems, huge problems, when we attempt to use it to deal with the threats that arise in the modern brain. And here's how that looks. <clears throat> so all of you, everyone listening, every single person will have experienced that physiology and fight flight and there was no physical threat. You will be responding to the threat to your needs. And unfortunately, when you started shaking or you increased heart rate or increased rapid breathing or you started sweating um, or you got butterflies or nausea, you thought there was something wrong with you. But what was actually happened was a normal physiological response. And even it's a desirable one. And we can use that information to identify, oh, there's no physical threat here. There must be a threat to my needs. In modern terms, we can very much focus I'm doing draw, got to uh, change it. There we go. So we can look at fight. I'll just try and move this box. I oh, can't do it. And flight. Fight is angering. And flight is anxiousing. Sorry, I'm going a little bit slow on this bit, but we'll get there. There we go. And why do we say them like that, angering and anxiousing? For those who know um, Glass's work, you will know it's because it's what we do. That's their verbs. We, we do angering and anxiousing. Um, if we're very aware of that, we can know exactly what's happening. So fight is angering. Oh, dear. Come on. There we go. And flight is anxiousing. If we're not successful at ang in dealing with the problem with angering and anxiousing, and we won't be because they don't deal with the actual threat, angering and anxiousing in the end don't work well at all. They actually make the situation uh, worse for us. Then we will start to do stressing. And if that doesn't work, and it won't, because it's not dealing with the actual threat that sits in the modern brain, then we need to shut the system down because all of that physiology is burning us out. So we start depressing. And stressing and depressing are what we do when angering and anxiousing really aren't working for us at all. Now, I'm not going to be able to fix that. Um, so th that's really the process, angering and anxiousing. When we're angering and anxiousing when, and stressing and depressing, What's actually happening is that that's a result of our physiological response to the threat of needs which are either directly threatened or not being met. First aid. When I'm working with people, the first thing I say is, let's do first aid. And the first aid sits over here under the um, endorphins and oxytocins. Because remember, that switches it off. 
But if we don't long-term deal with the threat to the needs, this will keep, the physiology will keep being um, fired up. So first aid we need to put in place. We need to duplicate or replicate, I should say, what we would do if it was a physical threat, which is to fight or flee. The activity, the exercise of doing that switches off the physiology. So we can replicate that by doing exercise. And the sort of exercise isn't too aggressive or too physical or too, um, uh, too high level. If you and I were exercising together, we were walking together, the level of exercise should be that we could walk without being breathless, but maybe sort of on the edge of it, but we should still be able to talk without being breathless. So a fairly, not rapid rate, but brisk, a brisk, but not too fast walk for at least 20 minutes. If you do that, you need about 20 minutes to fire up the endorphins. If you go off and play a game of basketball or football or, or something really vigorous, what you actually do is you fire up more adrenalines and noradrenalines, and that makes the situation worse, which is the mistake people are often told, go away and do some exercise, but the exercise they do is too vigorous. And it doesn't have that effect of slowing down the process. And the other thing is the oxytocins. We need to be doing those things that give us pleasure things that we enjoy, particularly with other people. That's why oxytocins are called, often called the hugging hormone. We need to connect with people, to be with people. And you, you've, you've heard Glasser say many times that connection is so, so important. It's the key to being able to meet our needs. We, if we don't do connection, we are not effectively long-term going to meet our needs. Unfortunately, when people are stressing and depressing, the first things they do is they stop exercising and they stop doing the things that are going to develop oxytocin, the things that they enjoy. They say they're too tired or too anxious to do those things. And that actually causes them to go further into stressing and depressing, which is why it's a verb. It's caused by what they're doing. So if we can do the first aid, of some exercise, 20 minutes a day, walking is enough. You can do more. You can walk for longer than that. You can walk more frequently. Three times a day will do no harm at all. You can miss a day, but don't miss a week or a, or a month. If you continue to do that, and even though you don't feel like it, you pick up the phone and you talk to your friends. You go out to that work function, even though you don't feel like it. Because once you're there, you will start to meet some of your needs and oxytocins and endorphins will start to kick in. Long-term, we need to come back up, not when we're in the middle of being very anxious or, or stressed or depressed, so in the middle of great stressing and depressing, which is why I said we need to do some first aid first, because we need to come up into the modern brain. And remember, when we look over here, confused thought, when we're at a higher level of anxiousing and angering, fight flighting, we're not doing logical thinking. So we need to do the first aid to bring that level down so that we can use logic, reasoning and problem solving to identify which of our needs are not being met and how we can effectively go about meeting them. And that is how we link Glass's understanding of needs really strongly and you can see how clearly it links with that whole fight flight and we can then use it when I teach people to instead of when they're anxiousing or angering or stressing or depressing instead of turning off and not doing all those things to do the first aid and then to go when they're feeling calmer and better and more collected to then try and identify which of those needs are not being met. Of course, in a counselling situation, I'll, I'll help them do that and help them figure out a way that works for them to go about meeting those needs. And once they do, it makes a huge difference because their threat response is not being triggered by the primitive brain. It's not recognising a threat that's not there. But also short term, just knowing this, when people walk out of my room after a session where I've taught them this, 
already they are better because, and better I don't mean as a person, I just mean better off, they're better because the next time they feel their heart rate increasing or they start sweating or shaking or they feel butterflies or nausea, they're able to say, ah, oh, I know what that is. That's what Jeff and I talked about. And that means they don't spiral down into deep levels of angering, anxiousing, stressing, depressing. They can catch it early. And if you can catch it early, the modern brain can still be involved. That's where I'm going to, to end that. I hope that that's clear for people. Um, Mona, I, uh, I, I love to share this and I, I do have a, a handout of this if, uh, if you like. I could send to you and people could access that if they want to. Okay, sounds good. And uh, we'll stop the sharing. Yep. So that, or maybe you need to on your end. <laughs> <laughs> Done. So whenever you uh, explain this to your clients and so forth, and then how do you help them to look at what their needs are? Yep. So I, I will then teach them about the needs. Um, we go through the process of teaching them what the needs are, that everybody has them. Um, we'll go through looking at them, what they might look like if they're, you know, for someone who's high in say love and belonging versus somebody who's low in love and belonging or survival or whatever it might be, or anywhere in between. We'll do a, a process where we then look at where they sit on that continuum. Are they high? Are they low? Are they medium? Um, and then we look at what they're doing in their current life and how effectively that is helping them meet those needs. Right. Very quickly. And, uh, you know, it only takes a few sessions and they're, within one set, two sessions, one to learn this, one to learn about the needs, they very quickly identify, oh, I can see what I need to do. And then they start putting into practice right. different behaviours that will more effectively meet those needs for them. It's a very so fast... That, and everything that you look at kind of is like the coin, that it's both yeah. the same thing. It just depends on which way yeah. you're using it. Absolutely. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I'm sure a lot of people will watch this and they receive great information. So thanks, Jeff. And we're going to close the recording and just send out to everyone good mental health. Thanks very much, Mona.